I would like to introduce you to Lucy, who is 62. She's a very active lady at this age, and I'm impressed because she's now started competing in amateur triathlons. She's a keen gardener, she enjoys yoga, and she started lifting weights at the gym with her personal trainer. She originally injured this shoulder last year, and she thought for a couple of months it might have been a pulled muscle, and she tried resting from her activities. Not a lot's changed, though. She's had to reduce her activity now and has trouble with daily tasks, including drying her hair, putting her bra on, and turning the key in her car. Okay, so we're going to discuss Lucy's case in a similar fashion to the first case. Question one, what are the possible causes of Lucy's pain? Any ideas? What are we thinking about? That's right. So in this age group, we're thinking rotator cuff, tendinosis, tendon pathology of sorts. That's right. Is that someone? Subacromial bursitis, so often going hand in hand with that rotator cuff pathology. Yep. Frozen shoulder, very good. Yep, um, certainly in this age group. Yes, glenohumeral joint osteoarthritis. Excellent. Very good. Dale, have you got anything you'd like to add there in terms of differentials in this age group and this history? I think that was a pretty comprehensive list of differentials. The only thing I would add is there's some important things that she's volunteered about, just activities that guide you on a diagnosis, like getting the hand behind the back. In a male, I asked patients about getting their hand into their back pocket. In a female, whether they can <laughs> um, do their bra strap up. Um, other ones that I think are worth asking about uh, above shoulder height activities such as um, doing their hair or putting clothes on and off the line are important. Um, sometimes patients will volunteer that they can't get their arm away from their chest to put deodorant on or they can't get the arm that's affected to reach across to the other shoulder. So when they start talking about that level of stiffness, be suspicious of frozen shoulder and osteoarthritis. Um, the, uh, and don't forget instability even in the older uh, patient. So she, you, I think when, you, when she's volunteered that pulling, don't just accept that as a mechanism of injury. Ask a little bit more, was there a clunk or did it feel as though the shoulder went in and out, even though she's sort of slightly out of the age group for that. Um, and as mentioned, don't forget the neck is a potential source of uh, referred pain to the shoulder and arm in general. Thanks, Dan. I think this is very relevant to us in day-to-day -day general practice. We see a lot of these patients coming through the door, and so it's nice to be really uh, set in terms of a specific history and specific examination findings, and hopefully tonight we'll tie that together so we feel really confident in moving forward with this very common presentation. So Dale's already given us, I guess, some specific questions that we might be asking Lucy. Can anyone think of anything else that we'd like to elicit from that history? I would probably add um, which hand does she write with, so is it her dominant side or not, I always check that with them. Um, and if we didn't know already, you know, is she still working, what's her occupation, and to get a really good um, activity history from her. So finding out in detail what those sports are or what she likes to do if she's not at work and she's retired, what her hobbies are and what she's actually using her arms for on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, sometimes I ask them about nighttime pain as well. When they roll over, do they have pain if they're lying on that side? Anything else from that general history? Um, Dale, can you take us a little bit further into the history that you would be asking? I think most of it covered. I think it's important to ask about the other shoulder. It may be something uh, non-orthopedic. It may be a, an inflammatory condition or PMR or something like that. So it's important to ask about other joints uh, in general if there's a, a history of um, inflammatory arthropathy or a family history of that. Mm. Um, I think maybe if there is some neck discomfort associated with it, ask a little bit more about neurological symptoms in terms of sensory disturbance, paresthesias, those types of things. Uh, whether there's clicking, catching, whether the shoulder pain ever leaves them. If, if, are they ever out of um, discomfort? You know, the history of a pulled shoulder is interesting because most patients, if you ask them enough, will link some activity to the onset of their symptoms. So sometimes history of trauma can be misleading as well and it may not be related to that uh, incident that they've said. Thank you. So we've taken a full history, we feel happy with that, now we move on to examining Lucy.
can someone take me through what any features we might be looking for or specifically even using our look, feel, move, anything we'd be watching for with this presentation? Any ideas? What are we, what are we asking her to do or what are we feeling for when we, when we examine her? Very good. So that was excellent. That was inspecting her first, looking for deformity, and then taking her through movement, passive and active movements. And you mentioned crepitus when she's performing those movements, so that's excellent. Maybe looking for where she gets her pain if she's performing those movements. Is it in a specific position? Does she have that painful arc that we mentioned before? That's right. Dale, can you take us through what you would look for with a physical examination with this presentation? So the same again, look, feel, move, x-ray, and on inspection to start off looking for wasting, like, like we were in the sort of instability setting, often the wasting is non-specific for the pathology, but if you look closely, you'll not only see deltoid wasting, but in someone like this, have a look at their, um, have both shoulders so you can see uh, the muscle girdle, the shoulder girdle musculature, particularly the supraspinatus muscle belly. And if someone's got long-standing cuff pathology, you'll often see a shallowing out above their scapular spine. If it's, if it's more extensive cuff tearing or cuff disease, you might see their infraspinatus wasting below the scapular spine. So it's, all, it's important to look from the front, the side and the back. Even in their armpit, sometimes you'll miss something unusual like lymphadenopathy in their armpit or a chronic sinus or something atypical. But make sure you've looked from all angles. Um, look for asymmetries. Again, with the AC joint with, a, with AC joint arthritis, you might see a more prominent AC joint on one side, suggestive of an osteophyte. Uh, and then feeling. I think it's really important to have a system. It doesn't matter where you start. I tend to leave their most painful spot for the last bit that you're going to probe and palpate for fear of hurting them prematurely in the exam and sort of restricting your yield. So I tend to start, usually the medial clavicle is non-tender and I work my way along. And in your mind, um, have an image of what you're palpating. So mid-clavicle, AC joint, going across the acromium and, and dropping down to the front of the cuff, uh, the supraspinatus at the top and then the posterior cuff, and just having some system and sort of, um, uh, rather than just sort of um, feeling vaguely along their shoulder, you'll be surprised at how often you'll find a focally tender spot. And if you do, repeat the palpation there at another part of the exam and rep re reproducible tenderness to palpation probably is the best sign in orthopaedics for uh, pathology. Um, and crepitus is important. I, I tend to do it through the movement phase. So again, with movement, it's active, passive power. So we'll start off with them doing the movements and I tend to get them doing both shoulders so you've got an instant comparison. And if they are grimacing or you think they're in pain, ask them where it hurts. Uh, often I'll put my hand on their shoulder during the abduction and forward flexion and you'll feel crepitus and often you'll be surprised at how accurate in delineating where the pathology is with the crepitus. If it's just under the skin here, often it'll be AC joint or the subdeltoid bursa. If it feels harsher than that or coarser or deeper, you may be feeling glenohumeral joint bone on bone crepitus. And I tend to, for the rotator cuff, and this is someone you'd be considering a rotator cuff tear, their supraspinatus, I use the empty can sign, so basically having their arm in the plane of the supraspinatus, which is the plane of the scapula, and asking them to resist you um, pushing down and they try and push to the ceiling. And sometimes they won't have uh, weakness, but they'll have pain and that's a, uh, a it means that their the supraspinatus may be involved or sometimes just the bursa. Um, resisted external rotation, so low down, that's testing the posterior cuff, so infraspinatus and teres minor, and then testing their subscapularis. Sometimes the best test for this, or the most specific, is a lift-off test, but often they don't have that range of motion, or if they're particularly sore, they won't even be able to get their hand behind their back. So I ask them to do a belly press, or some people describe this as a Napoleon test, and if they have significant subscapularis pathology, they'll often drop their wrist, so their wrist will be flexed, and they won't be able to bring their elbow past the mid-coronal plane of the body. Um, if there's one thing I can sort of, a take-home message for tonight, if someone has loss of active and passive range of motion, uh, which is different to someone losing their active, but you being able to get, put their shoulder through a good range of motion, 
There's really only two common presentations. There are some others, but in the general practice setting, osteoarthritis and frozen shoulder. The third one is a missed posterior dislocation, which you won't see that often, but keep, keep it in mind uh, for the reasons we've sort of already discussed. But an X-ray will differentiate those three before you even get to an ultrasound MRI. So if they've lost global movement actively and passively, you can already then narrow it down to frozen shoulder or osteoarthritis of the glenohumeral joint. And often, you know, um, you, you can um, tailor their and expedite their management and get them treated appropriately and not worry about other sort of cuff pathologies. If they, if they do have cuff pathologies in those two settings, usually the osteoarthritis and the frozen shoulder have to be treated as the priority anyway. So sometimes you don't need to go past an x-ray for that patient. But if you can delineate between active and passive range of motion, you're halfway there to making the diagnosis a lot of the time. And sometimes it's just getting them comfortable enough to do it. And, um, and comparing it to the other side. Because sometimes people don't have, I don't have a lot of external rotation, a lot of middle age and older males lose a bit, but compare to the other, other side and look for asymmetry. On the special tests, we mentioned some of them before. So painful arc you'll see in the plane of the scapula going up. Uh, but the, uh, we've spoken about the empty can sign. Some provocative tests for AC joint pathology, cross body adduction. And compare that to the other side, because sometimes patients confuse a tight feeling to, to pain or discomfort. Sometimes you'll see it on the other side, cross-body adduction, or getting them in that thumb-down position across their body and resisting. Often they'll uh, point to their AC joint as the sign of, uh, site of pain. That's important for sort of zoning down on the AC joint. Uh, and then moving on to examining their neck um, and uh, sensation and neurology after that than a plain film. Thanks, Dale. That's excellent. I guess I just wanted to, to reinforce one thing, and I know it's always tricky in the setting of a really busy general practice and there's patients lining up down the corridor, but one of the most important things for us is to adequately expose that patient, and it's hard when they have a lot of pain and they're fiddling with their buttons and it's taking an extra two minutes and you just want to get that shirt off try and always remember to expose. It's easy with the gentleman, they'll often take the shirt off. With the ladies, make sure you go do get down to their bra or their crop top, and if they're uncomfortable, you know, tuck a sheet in or something. But you do need to see that shoulder, even if it does take an extra two minutes to expose the patient. Try not to shortcut on there. Okay, question four. So we're doing well. We've examined this patient. We now need to launch into our investigations. And as Dale mentioned, we've already considered a plain X-ray because we know that's the basic starting point for imaging the shoulder. Is there any other investigations we should consider at this stage? Ultrasound. Ultrasound. Excellent. Thank you. Anything else anyone would consider? MRI. Yep, there is that option as well. And I might get Prof back at this stage just to talk us through the role of these various modalities. Just going back to the... Um the previous case deal showing you the lethargy shoulder stabilisation. It reminded me, I was saying earlier to deal, um, there was another procedure called the Putty Platt procedure. And Sir Harry Platt was an orthopaedic surgeon in Manchester. And he taught me all I know about revision spinal surgery. Because I asked him once about his thoughts on it as a shoulder surgeon. He said, the one thing I know about revision spinal surgery is you don't debugger a buggered back by rebuggering it. And I thought, that really sums it up very well indeed. <laughs> In terms of imaging of the shoulder, a lot of patients come to the department with a, a request for shoulder ultrasound and they haven't had a plain film. The vast majority of those, I actually will do a self-determined conventional radiograph, as well as the ultrasound. The reason for that is that ultrasound has its limitations, the primary limitation being looking at bone surface pathology. And so if someone comes along with a request for an ultrasound, I usually just do a self-determine, I just add on the plain film. Um, in terms of um, looking at pathology, if you're looking for subacromial impingement rotator cuff disease, in the early stage, you basically, in all intents and purposes, get a normal radiograph. 
You might see some calcification if they've got calcification within the calf secondary to impingement. And usually rotator calf calcification is secondary to impingement. If you actually do an acromioplasty and you take away the impingement, then very often the calcification will disappear in its own right. So it's there because of the impingement. Unfortunately, because of the mass effect and any swelling around the calcification, it can then make the impingement worse. So it becomes a vicious cycle. In terms of ultrasound, ultrasound is actually the best way of showing a range of early and subtle shoulder pathologies. It's good at demonstrating, I'll show you some, hopefully some dynamic ones in a second. This is a relatively normal rotator cuff. This one gets truncated at the edge. This one actually there's bony problem as well as truncation of the rotator cuff. So those are full thickness or extensive intrasubstance supras, uh, supraspinatus tendon tears. You can do the same thing in terms of MRI. And the MRI will, again, show you this. In this instance, there's a huge gap in the supraspinatus tendon. The tendon that's there is supposed to be down here somewhere. And again, a defect. So MRI will show it. But in the main, ultrasound will actually give you more information when it comes to patients with a painful arc. And that's for the simple reason that when you do the ultrasound study, you're essentially doing it as an extension of clinical examination. So if you're looking at early subacromial impingement, ultrasound will show it better than any other imaging modality. If you're looking at early rotator cuff tendinopathy, it's the same scenario. Okay, this is the supraspinatus tendon, and it's now going to disappear underneath the acromion, okay? That's what it's supposed to do. But what happens in the early pathology, if you've got early subacromial impingement, what happens is that the fluid from the subacromial part of the bursa gets squashed out into the subdeltoid part of the bursa. And that's the earliest sign that you'll see of subacromial impingement on ultrasound. But it's that dynamic bit that Dale was talking about that is the clue. If you look at the painful arc, if a patient's got painful arc due to subacromial impingement, it is usually between the 45 to 90 degrees of abduction range of movement. When you go above 90 degrees. It's not the supraspinatus tendon that actually is then acting. It's usually the middle portion of deltoid that's acting. If you've got painful arc above 90 degrees, it usually is because they've got high arc impingement and it's usually because of pathology at the chromoclavicular joint. And usually, as Dale was saying, if someone's got AC joint pathology, the patient will put their finger there. If they've got subacromial impingement and they've got bursal pathology, because of the referred pain to the bursa, they usually point to pain across the, uh, in that region. And so I try to teach my sonographers to actually use that information to try and enhance the dynamic part of the study that they're doing. And one of the things that I train the sonographers to do is not to give up on patient's movement because sometimes patients won't go through the range of movement because of pain inhibition and because pain they won't let you. So you've got to get the patient to completely take the weight so you can take your arm up. And so by doing those clinical assessment maneuvers but with a transducer on the patient, you can see what the tendon is doing. You can do what the soft, see what the soft tissue structures are doing at the same time as you're doing that clinical assessment. And you can then divide it up. Because if someone's got subacromial impingement, they've got loss of active ad abduction between 45 and 90 degrees. But they've got normal passive range of movement. If you've got a, a severe adhesive capsulitis, then you will lose active and passive range of movements. 
In terms of high arc impingement, they'll have pain above 90 degrees. Usually I do it so that I get them to take their arm across to touch the other shoulder. And the patient will often say, yes, that hurts, and it's hurting beneath where the transducer is, because the transducer is over the, uh, a, the AC joint at the same time. Okay. So by using the pattern of active and passive motion, combined with the sonography, you can usually differentiate fairly accurately between those range of disease processes. So demonstrated well on ultrasound, but not MRI, is the ad early adhesive capsulitis and high arc AC joint impingement. Now this is for high arc impingement. This is the acromioclavicular joint. And as I'm getting the patient to take their arm across, What's happening is the two ends of the clavicle come together and this black blob that's on top that gets squashed out is actually the synovium and the joint capsule from the AC joint. So the joint normally starts off planar and then as you get them to take their arm across then the clavicle and the acromion become more opposed and they'll squash the soft tissues out between the two of them. Now that's actually a common phenomenon uh, just because they've got it doesn't mean it's a symptomatic AC joint and high arc impingement. But if they've got that and they say, yes, there's pain underneath the transducer, then that usually is fairly accurate. And it's relevant in terms of what I then subsequently do. Because if I'm asked to inject the shoulder, if I see pathology like that at the AC joint, I will inject that as opposed to injecting the bursa. Now, it may be they've got both pathologies but not necessarily. Okay, in terms of adhesive capsulitis, this is now in transverse, and this is looking at external rotation. And the first clue for me from images as to whether someone's got an adhesive capsulitis is whether I can see subscapularis. Because for a sonographer to see subscapularis properly, they've got to be able to externally rotate the humeral head to bring subscapularis parallel to the skin surface. Usually uh, in a frozen shoulder adhesive capsulitis, the first thing to go and the last thing to come back is external rotation. This is now someone, that's the supraspinatus tendon there at the top, and you can see that it's staying there, okay? This, that supraspinatus tendon is supposed to go underneath the bone. It's not going underneath the bone. And what will happen in those circumstances, you'll get the patient to move like that, and it looks like the patient's still moving. They're still able to abduct the arm, but there's nothing moving beneath the acromion. So what happens is that the patient takes the arm up, and then they get scapular thoracic movement, rather than they get movement at the glenohumeral joint. So if you just look at a patient, look at them from the side, they can look like they're still lifting their arm up, but the ultrasound actually tells you that there's nothing happening at the shoulder joint, that all of that movement is occurring elsewhere, as say usually at the scapula thoracic articulation. Just going back again to one other little point, and that is if you've got uh, subacromial impingement and rotator cuff disease, in someone under the age of about 25 to 30, it's usually because they've got underlying glenohumeral instability. And I usually then get the sonographers to do some of the common tests, the five common tests for joint hyperlaxity. You can also sometimes see things such as this is an osochromiale, and a symptomatic osochromiale can be another cause of subacromial impingement, rotator cuff tendinopathy in a relatively young individual. And the CT has the role of showing the bony spurs at the margin of the acromion and I'll show the osochromiale. Um, again, when I was saying earlier on about the double contrast CT arthrography, because for a GP they can refer that, but also in our instance it's bulk build, so we can actually do that without any out of cost for the patient as well. So in terms of if you've got high arc impingement, if you've got subacromial impingement, if you've got adhesive capsulitis, ultrasound gives you the information that you usually require, but only 
if you take into account the dynamic part of the study. If you just take the static images, it'll show you whether there's a cuff tear there or not, but it won't tell you the rest of what's going on with the patient. And of course, someone can have subacromial impingement. That pain can then go on to causing a adhesive capsulitis. So you, these things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive of each other as well. I would uh, advocate the dynamic component of the ultrasound over the static MRI. I think it's nice to um, be specific about your provisional diagnosis. Not always will you get the service that Wayne is um, offering with differential um, joint injection, but I think if you give as much clinical information about whether you think it's um, subacromial impingement versus AC pathology, and, um, and if you're adding the, onto the request a cortisone injection, then they can uh, make use of some of that dynamic uh, information to augment the management and um, either inject the um, AC joint or the bursa, or sometimes there's other parts of the shoulder I even ask the radiologist to inject for in specific scenarios. I just think we'll, if we'll just say that in this case Lucy has been fully investigated and we've probably come to the diagnosis of a rotator cuff tear and we'll let Dale take on with the management there. There's a lot to take into the uh, process of managing these patients with rotator cuff repairs. I tend to think of it as ends of a spectrum rather than black and white um, answers when you're considering patients for surgery versus no surgery on rotator cuff repairs. On the one hand, if you've got a healthy, young, and young more sort of um, physiological rather than chronological years, and an acute event who didn't have any shoulder symptoms, that patient at one end of the spectrum favouring surgical management early on versus the other patient who's had a number of years of progressive shoulder, shoulder pathology, may or may not have had any traumatic event, um, not tried any um, non-surgical uh, modalities, then I would consider that patient I'm more lean towards um, physiotherapy, um, anti-inflammatories, uh, um, one uh, or more corticosteroid injections, and consider them for surgery only if they'd failed an appropriate uh, non-operative course of management. Um, unfortunately, most patients fall somewhere in the middle. So um, uh, you tend to have to use a little bit of um, clinical acumen in how you manage them. But generally speaking, if it's a traumatic event in an otherwise healthy patient, I would be considering those for surgery. If it's um, progressive pain without any history of trauma, especially in an elderly patient with a number of comorbidities, then I'd be looking towards maximising their non-surgical management. Did anyone have any um, questions about management of rotator cuff tendon tears? Can, can I actually ask a question? Yes. Um, I quite often get requests for uh, injection of shoulders. And I get them say, you know, queer rotator cuff pathology, if there is pathology to inject. Now on a number of those, I actually don't inject even though they've got subacromial impingement. So, for instance, someone's a 45-year-old painter and decorator. They are starting, they've got subacromial impingement and they're starting to tear that cuff. Now, I don't inject them and actually say, say on the report, I would advise referring to an orthopedic shoulder surgeon to assess prior to whether they're injected or not because I have concerns about ultrasound potentially compromising the subsequent surgery and potentially um, hiding the fact that the cuff tearing is going to get worse. Now, am I right in doing that or should I be just injecting them and say what? I totally concur with that. That, that patient I wouldn't be injecting, I'd be um, working them up for surgical repair. And that's what it gets down to, you said, about the clinical acumen bit. I think that it has to be taken all the time into context of the patient, that 
yeah, if you've got someone that's in their 80s, they've got a full thickness rotator cuff tear, then you're probably safe enough and not, not to worry about it. So you actually just have to take that context. So if people do refer shoulders to me and I don't inject them, you will actually understand that there's usually a reason why. Before moving on, some specific factors of the actual tear and whether it's repairable or not. There are some times where the tear is just too big or too retracted or there's some secondary changes in the muscle belly. If it's become severely uh, atrophied or there's starting to get fat infiltration into the muscle belly, especially when it becomes most of the muscle belly. So if fat is infiltrating more than 50% of the muscle belly, particularly infraspinatus, it's a pretty poor prognostic sign for a successful rotator cuff repair. So that's another clue that might direct you towards non-surgical management. An MRI, um, NCT, uh, reasonable at looking for that. This is a sagittal slice just showing that. On the right-hand side, you can see um, muscle bellies of um, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis. Now, this is a healthy-looking muscle belly. This uh, supraspinatus muscle belly is atrophied, and there's a small amount of fat infiltration in there. But the atrophy is probably more impressive than the fat infiltration here. On this slide, this is severe atrophy of supra and infra and fatty replacement. And this is a patient who probably would do poorly with a rotator cuff repair. Even if you could get the end of the tendon back to the bone, the, t the muscle tendon unit doesn't function very well when there's this much atrophy and fat infiltration. But, but on that, it's also worthwhile just comparing the deltoid and trapezius because sometimes they've actually got a global muscle atrophy, not just because of the rotator cuff disease. That's a good point as well. I, I thought I might just, um, uh, just show a couple of operative short videos just to show you how they're treated surgically. This is an arthroscopic uh, rotator cuff repair. So this is looking posteriorly at the um, supraspinatus tendon. I've got a, a blunt metal probe probing the tendon. This is the torn supraspinatus. Just here is the infraspinatus. Uh, and on the floor of the picture here is the greater tuberosity. And the supraspinatus is actually avulsed off the bone which is probably the most common way to tear your rotator cuff. It's not the only way you can get stumps of tendon left behind and sometimes the stump can be difficult to manage here and we end up doing a tendon to tendon repair. Uh, this is the long head of biceps anteriorly running at the front of the supraspinatus. The next one is um, once we've cleaned up a few things, this is me just picking up the edge of the supraspinatus, making sure that it sits back down like a jigsaw and is repairable. And this is a reasonably fresh tear. There's a fair bit of blood around. It's quite healthy looking tendon. So this is a chromium up here, greater tuberosity down here looking from the back. This is uh, part of the way through the repair. So the rotator cuff tendon is a flat tendon as opposed to a cylindrical tendon of our flexor tendons of our fingers. So we need to anchor it in more than one point because the greater tuberosity has a fairly large surface area. Once we freshen it, we put anchors in the bone that have these cable braided sutures. You can see here this is a full width of supraspinatus just adjacent to the uh, long head of biceps here and the rotator interval here. And we start leashing the uh, tendon back down to bone and we end up with a series of anchors. And this is uh, a nice secure repair. I'm actually moving the shoulder around making sure there's no independent movement of the, of the tendon. Often we'll combine this with a subacromial decompression. This is the and an AC joint excision. This is the end of the collarbone here. And you can see there's plenty of space now for this repaired tendon once we get him moving in an active fashion, which starts after about six weeks. Because of this broad footprint of tendon, we do a row of medial anchors and lateral anchors. And over here, you see the, the muscle belly. So any, any questions about rotator cuff problems in general practice or shoulder problems in, um, in general? We've mainly focused on dislocations and rotator cuff pathologies, touched upon frozen shoulder. It's always bear, worth bearing in mind frozen shoulder. And as uh, Professor said, there's often an overlap between <coughs> impingement cuff disease, and often they'll start out with impingement, and they'll end up with a frozen shoulder overlapping or becoming the, most, uh, uh, the biggest part of the presentation.
and my standard management of frozen shoulder it starts with a lengthy explanation of what frozen shoulder is it has a, a long natural history if left alone but most patients will resolve sometimes if they've got associated pathologies you end up waiting for the frozen shoulder to get better or resolve depending on how you're going to treat it and then focusing on the cuff tear or impingement uh, whatever their residual symptoms are I tell them that it's a disease of the capsule. You might have seen this in your own practice. The most common patients I see with it are with diabetes, but it can be related to other endocrine abnormalities. I also work at Prince Charles Hospital, which is a large um, cardiology uh, inpatient load, and often after uh, heart attacks, um, even open heart surgery, you see frozen shoulder. Uh, surgery is not the first line treatment for frozen shoulder. I tend to start off with intra-articular corticosteroid, usually with a, a hydrodistension or a hydrodilatation done by someone, a radiologist like Professor Gibbon, uh, and then work up to surgery as a last resort. Surgery tends to be most successful after that acute inflammatory stage of frozen shoulder. So I let them get into the sort of, if you break it down into freezing, frozen, thawing, into that sort of frozen or early thawing stage uh, where I'd consider them for surgery, where the patients are really just fed up and they don't seem to be progressing. Uh, but a capsular release and manipulation, which is the surgery for it, is the, the last step in the, the phase of treatment or the treatment um, sort of algorithm. It's probably reasonable to be more aggressive with early frozen shoulder than you are in terms of cuff disease in that it's one thing having a painful joint, it's another thing having a painful stiff joint. So you really don't want to have both pain and stiffness. So I, I, I must admit I've got a lower threshold yeah, for doing for... intra-steroid injections there than I have for if it's just the impingement type problem. Conventional wisdom says that you should only inject anything three times. Okay. Now, there are a number of reasons why that's the case. One of it's historical because it was done on palpation and you didn't know exactly where the needle is. That's one of them. Second part of it, though, is that uh, steroids actually have a chondrolytic effect, so you can actually potentially damage articular cartilage from it as well, and you've got the ability to generate a neuropathic joint, so it might take away the pain, but you can still have problems with it. So I, the reason for not repeatedly injecting joints isn't necessarily because of potential damage to the soft tissues, which is undoubtedly still a case, but it's also the question of what's doing to the articular cartilage, what's it doing to the nerves. In terms of corticosteroid injection and the number of, I think it's exactly as Wayne was saying. If, if you've got a, it, it depends on the indication. If you're injecting corticosteroid into an already arthritic joint and you're not worried about causing degeneration in the cartilage surface, I'm happy to do more. Or if you're injecting um, extra articularly, so into the bursal surface when there's an intact cuff, someone who may not be suitable for surgery who gets good response to the corticosteroid, I'm happy to do three and sometimes even more. But I'm a bit careful with cortisone on cartilage, especially in you know, patients who have a very healthy cartilage, like frozen most frozen shoulder patients have normal articular cartilage. Um, so I do do it, but I do talk to them about that as a potential effect and try and limit it to one, sometimes two. Um, and that's, but, in, that's in terms of the shoulder. When you're talking about weight-bearing large joints, such as the knee, the hip and the ankle, you should be even more circumspect about injecting intraarticular steroids. So yeah, in the knee, very happy to do multiple extra articular joint injections for PES, anserine bursitis and other extra articular pathologies. But if someone's got otherwise healthy cartilage, you exactly limit the, the number of corticosteroid injections. Um, Well, I think you could you could even be aggressive with the hydro distension. Mm. On if if patients get some benefit from that, uh, or uh, have had no benefit from it, um, but are not wanting to go ahead with surgery, or still really bothered by pain and stiffness, I'll have I'll, I'll have no hesitation in just sending them for hydro dilatation without the corticosteroid. Or corticosteroids in if they've got a frozen shoulder secondary to subacromial impingement.
to put steroids into the bursa to try and reduce the pain, to try and help them to mobilise a bit more and do a hydrostatic distension at the same time to try to actually break down any of the, the adhesions inside. And so it, 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 it is right about trying to minimise the amount of intraarticular steroids that someone gets. It's never quite that easy because if someone's got a full thickness rotator cuff tear, even if it's a pinhole, and I put steroids into the bursa, that will actually work its way through into the glenohumeral joint. So sometimes you'll get it in the glenohumeral joint, even if you know you've injected into the bursa. So, sonographically, 80% of 80-year-olds have got a rotator cuff tear, okay? and not all of them have got symptoms in terms of their rotator cuff. It's like everything. It's trying to correlate what you see in imaging, what you see in clinical findings, you know, to try and marry the two of them up. It's the same with spinal cases. You might see uh, L5S1 disc. What's the relevance if it's actually that they've got uh, L3 pathology on the opposite side? It's the same in terms of trying to correlate what you see sonographically, what you see on MR, with what someone like Dale is actually seeing clinically. So I think if you marry the history exam and the imaging studies and it adds up to impingement and there's bothered by it, then consider them for treatment. But isolated impingement reported on dynamic ultrasound that doesn't fit in with your history and your clinical exam, I wouldn't treat them as impingement. I'd, I'd fall back on your clinical acumen.